Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to, without wasting time, just talk about some of the things that I think you, you need to know. I believe that uh, I'm going to talk, talk to you about some precious things that if you'll hide in your heart and grasp it, it will change you. I'm not preaching, I'm teaching and I'm speaking. So I want to say this, that, you know, I watched TV last night and uh, I was watching uh, National Geog no, the Travel Channel. They were showing me, showing us a program of Pakistan. And uh, there was Muslim men, but the thousands, hundreds of thousands. And they were beating their breast, you know, like this hard. I mean, they had the shirts off. So some of them were very fair, light-skinned. And you could see the chest area actually get very red because of the blood and the pounding of the chest. And they were wailing and mourning. And so I thought, this is crazy. What are they doing? So I was listening to the program carefully to find out what they're doing. And uh, as the program went along, they changed from crying. I mean, these were big men. These were just mostly men. But the thousands, I mean, not thousands, hundreds of thousands. And they were crying and mourning and wailing and crying and, and then they stopped at the time and they took a piece of ro a stone that big and they tied it in a piece of string and they started to beat their backs like this. So as they struck their back, the stone was digging into the flesh at the back and it was a gory sight. It was terrible. So the flesh was being dug and, and lacerated and the blood was pouring I mean, the guy, it was a white guy, that was doing the, 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 the commentary, and he was looking at all these Pakistanis. They were from the Sunni tribe. And he was saying, he said, he, he could not stand to watch this because the sight was so gory. And then at the end, he said, well, all of this is a ceremony. Oh, now that caught my ear. I started to listen. He said because it was a wailing and a mourning ceremony for the death of the last descendant, the prophet of the prophet, the holy prophet. His descendant was, I think, Suleiman, and he died some years back, many years back. So this was, a, it, it could, I, I'm not sure how long, could be several hundred years, could be, I don't know, a hundred years. They didn't, he didn't specify that, but this last descendant of that prophet had died. So every year, the same time, they have a wailing ceremony. And they beat themselves, and this is whole day in the sun. So they stand the whole day in the sun, beating their breast. And after about midday, they start to beat their backs. Every man, every, I, I was amazed, I saw small children maybe five years old, cry, wail, mourn, and take the stone with a string and plow those backs. And I thought that was hideous, but something caught me and I said, my, a Muslim is so committed to his cause. And Christians aren't. You see where I'm going now? Christians are so soft and so tender that if you touch the wrong nerve, just touch the wrong nerve, they get offended and they will not want to come to church or they will not want to be involved in the service because they're so tender. Yet these men who are not covenant men, these men who are serving a false god. They don't know it. They think it's their god. But it's a false god. We know it. And they are so committed with a passion and a drive to do that. I just thought, shame on us as Christians. If I had to ask a question, you don't have to answer it, but if I had to ask a question, I'd say, how many of you 
If we had to all be shot today, in other words, to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and if someone tells us to recant our confession or withdraw our confession, otherwise they'll kill us, the question would be, how many of us would say, I will not deny Christ. Shoot me, I'll lose my life if I have to. I will die for my cause. When you watch CNN and CBN, and you watch them showing the bombers, the terrorists, that go and bomb up the places in Israel, in um, London, and all of that. These are young men, not older than 25, some as young as 22, that's recruited on the internet for the course, an Islamic course. They call it a holy war, jihad. And these men strap themselves with explosive and bombs and go to a place, they blow themselves up, and they blow 25, 30, 100 people with them, all for a cause, and they think they're doing it for God. But they're not doing it for God. You know that. But their commitment, you catch what I'm saying? And I want you to measure our commitment as a Christian as compared to them. Are you prepared to die for your cause? Think about what I'm asking you. If I would say to you, lay your life down for Christ and die for the cause, would you, would you die for the cause? <laughs> it's a sobering question. But without a type of commitment like that, we're never going to save the world or affect the, the place for the, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We just won't. Because it is an unflinching commitment. It is an undaunting commitment. It is a commitment that says everything or nothing. You catch what I'm saying? Now, we're talking about leadership. And one of the things I want to challenge you is this. Are you willing to pay such a price for Christ? Because if you're not willing to pay such a price, you have to revisit your foundations and see what is really my commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. That amidst all of our wanting for prosperity and for advancement in our lives, in the material lives, there's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper, even as your soul prospers. So there's nothing wrong to have nice houses and nice cars and nice clothes. Nothing wrong with that. But it must still have its rightful place. That means you at a moment notice are able to give it up for the sake of the gospel. If you're holding anything more dearly than the sake of Christ, then I challenge you to revisit your foundations again. I said to Pastor Wesley, today we were talking, I said, I am able to give up now anything for the Lord. Just like that. It's a truth. I'm saying it to you, and I'll do it. You have to have that type of commitment. Remember the words of Jesus. He says, those that do not want to take up the cross daily and follow me, not worthy to be my disciple." And it's quite a sober thing that I'm saying to you. It is, uh, I, I'm not asking you to answer. I'm not asking you to think, but just revisit it in your own heart personally before you and God and say, okay, Lord, what am I committed to and how much am I committed to? Am I prepared to die for you? In other words, what I'm saying to you, and these are leaders here, what I'm saying to you as, as part of leadership, we cannot have people that are weak-minded, feeble-minded as leadership. A leader should not even think about offense. I should never, as a pastor, ask a leader in the church, are you offended? It should be absent from our vocabulary. You are past offense now. 
think, of, think about what I'm saying, teens. It's just like that. You, you are so mature, so committed, so one with the Lord, so, so for the gospel that you can never get offended. Offense should never be in your vocabulary. It doesn't matter what. And uh, because you come, you arm yourself with that knowledge that it doesn't matter what happens, it doesn't matter how big the challenge is, I'm able to fight this fight. Because you'll have to contend for your faith. That's what the Bible tells us, fight the good fight of faith. So there's a fight to fight. So you must contend for the faith. And there's a fight to fight. What is that fight that you're going to fight? You're going to fight for your faith. In other words, your belief system, your salvation, the things that you believe in. You, you've got to hold on to that, okay? I sobered you up now. I got your attention now. And that's where I'm driving you to. Because you cannot have a leadership that's weak. You cannot have a leadership that's, you know, yay or nay or on the fence. You've got to have a leadership that's ticking all the way. Go, 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 go. Green. You might be red inside, but green on the outside. You, you, you understand? That's the type of a leader God wants. And it doesn't matter how much your pressure hits you and what hits you. I was sharing with someone the other day. I said, for one and a half years, I had a challenge. It was a big challenge, a big, big challenge. Mark was with me, and we were talking about that with another pastor. I said, I really, when I look back, I do not know how I preached for, those year, for that year. I do not know. I can't tell you. I cannot tell you how I came to church every Sunday and every Tuesday, encouraged the church, did the Bible study, and edified the people of God. And they would have thought, nothing's wrong, but I was going through a, a big challenge. For over a year, and I kept on ticking. There came a time where I thought, whoa, I should give up the church. Now, no, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking maybe pastor did a personal sin. No, it wasn't that. <laughs> but it was just a big challenge I was dealing with. And, um, and then I realized, but that's what God wants. He wants you to as tough as nails. That separates now the men and please, even though I'm using those terminologies, men and boys, I'm referring to both sexes, right? But that separates the men from the boys. Uh -huh. In other words, you can take the heat that's in the kitchen and still keep on cooking and smelling sweet at the same time. You, you understand? You might be going through financial challenges at home and in your business or whatever it is, and you're still coming to, you're smiling at church, and you're shaking hands of people, and you're encouraging people, and the people say, wow, look at that guy. He's on fire for God. But inside you're crumbling. But that's between you and God, because you're trusting Him, because your faith level now is just gone a few notches up. So you are one that's able to trust God, lean on Him, get encouragement from the Holy Spirit, and still help others. So leaders ought to be past the stage where you are discouraged. Discouragement is not in your vocabulary. Discouragement should not be there. Offended should not be there. Scratch it out. Tell your neighbor, scratch those words out. Discouragement out. Offense out. Um, weakness out. Out. No, you are strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You are single minded, single minded, armed with knowledge, armed with a fight in your heart. You understand? Not dubious, not doubtful. You're just pressing on. Doesn't matter what. Doesn't matter what I hear. You know, one of the things, I'll share this with you, one of the most amazing things is that leaders should not listen to gossip. Now, I'm not dealing with the subject because we have any issues at church. No, really, we don't have any issues. I'm just saying how it will affect you.
The, the Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 17, it says, He that is first in his own cause seemeth just, but his neighbor, his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. Now the Amplified Bible says, read it to me in the Amplified. It, he who states his case first. He who states his case first seems right My. until his rival comes and cross-examines him. Right, say it again. He who states his case first now seems Now listen, right. listen to this. It says, he that states, states his, his case, case first, first seems right. Seems right. Until his rival comes. Until his rival comes. And cross-examines him. And cross-examines him. Now what I found was, especially in dealing with church work and amongst Christians is that always people are quickly to speak about something that um, or they offended about or someone's hurt them and they present one side of the story. But when you present the other side of the story, it seems like they have no case, the case falls. That's what the Bible is saying here. In other words, the person that first states his case seems right until another comes and cross-examines him and questions him, and you find, wow, this is not right. That's why leaders should never, ever give themselves yearning to gossip. You should protect the vision at all times and protect what you believe at all times. You protect what you have in the church at all times because... What you may hear may not be the truth. Are, are, are you listening to me? Now, if you would receive those words as the truth without examining it and without questioning it, you may receive an untruth and destroy your faith, make shipwreck of your faith, not knowing whether this is true or untrue. Does that make sense? So you should always, as a leader, be wise when you're listening to things. Just be careful that you do not be thrown in the deep end with a story that's tall and not right. Wait till you hear. That's why the Bible says, Receive not an accusation of an elder, except it be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. That means if someone comes and speaks bad about one of your leaders or your pastors, you're not, you're not to entertain that because the Bible says it must be established in the mouth of two, three witnesses. So in other words, what it's saying is that it's advocating or instructing you to what? To examine what's being presented. Don't just accept it. Because rumors are just so, uh, you know, so many times I've heard people say, and I'm not talking about the church context now. I'm just talking about ordinarily. People will say, this happened and that happened and that happened. And I said, whoa, where did you hear this from? Did you see it on the news or did you read it in the newspaper? No, uh, they said. <laughs> and you find who's they? They can't even tell you who's they. And if you really examine who's the they, it's only one. And that one is a disgruntled brother too who's in a backslidden state. So there's, there's, there's no... Uh, there's no case, there's no basis for an argument. And therefore, I'm saying, and like I'm saying, I'm not dealing with no issues in the church, really. Uh, I'm just saying, guard yourself. You'd rather, if you listen to something, rather go to one of the pastors and say, or your cell leaders, or you being a leader, and I'm sharing this with you so that you know how to address things. Because from time to time, you're going to get a person in your home cell that's going to come to you and say, uh, brother so-and-so, um, we heard this rumor, pastors taking the church to Mars. So don't run with it. Say, where did you hear this from? Oh, they said, who's they? Oh, no, I heard. Brother, no, 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 no. Don't hear, don't hear rumors. Has pastor said that? No. Have I said that as your leader? No. Then keep quiet. It is, it is hearsay. It is not factual. Very important. And as leaders, you need to know. Let me share this with you. And that's why I'm sharing this with you. 
As leaders, you know, you must know what to kill. When there's a fire, starve it of oxygen. Otherwise, it'll devour you and devour the other person all in the same process. What do I mean by starve it of oxygen? It means if someone says, oh, have you heard? Have you heard? What? Uh, so-and-so wore a short dress. Then just say, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. Oh, no, but I saw it. So you shouldn't be looking at someone's short dress. Keep your, keep your eyes on the, on the word. I'm just showing you just a <clears throat> simple example how to kill something. And that's something you need to kill. You need to kill a rumor. You need to kill something that is not edifying. You need to kill something that is not going to add value to your walk with the Lord or your faith. You need to kill something that will not, you know, just generally build up the other believers. You need to kill that. And you need to give, you need to give oxygen so, to those testimonies and those things that build the work of the Lord. Because remember that one of the biggest things we're contending with is with the devil. And the devil's very real. And he brings in divisions and strife. And all of those wicked things. So we've got to be on the guard for that. Just be on the guard for that. And the Bible tells us, mark them that cause division amongst you. Very important. Mark them that cause division amongst you. That means if people come and they don't, don't want to add value to your church or to you. It means, mark them means avoid them. Don't even have tea with that brother and sister. You just, uh-uh. You may be in the same church, but I'm sorry. You are not a good person. You, 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 you understand? Sit down. So, the reason I'm sharing this with you is that how do you handle these things that's going to come to you? I'm not sharing these things with you because there is a situation. No. Uh, there's no situation at the moment. I'm sharing these things with you so that when they do come up in your home cell... They do come up in your area. You are equipped to deal with it, all right? Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Now, I want you to turn in your Bible to uh, 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. And I want to address the issue of understanding the times, all right? Uh, would someone read that for me, Pastor Wesley? 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 32. I mean, sorry, 1 Chronicles 12, verse 32. It says, and, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, the heads of them were 200, and all their brethren were at their commandment. You find, thank you, Pastor Ways, you find here that the sons of Issachar, they understood the times. So there is what we have, a natural calendar, which we use, but there's a God's calendar or a heavenly calendar. And uh, there are cycles in the realm of the Spirit. Cycles in the realm of the Spirit. When these cycles are operating in the church or in your life, don't miss it. Tell your neighbor, don't miss it. Now, when these cycles are operating in the realm of the Spirit, it's God doing something. And if you miss it, like I said the other night, it might only visit you 10 years afterwards. Therefore, you've got to be so spiritually in tune not to miss it. You can't afford to miss it. Life is so short. Your stay on the earth is not long. It is short. Your destiny here on earth is inspired by God. It's driven by God. There's a divine connection there's a divine uh, impartation. There's a divine prophecy. You can't miss it. So as leaders, you must understand the seasons and the times. If you miss it, you may miss it for 10 years. There are times and seasons in the spirit. There are times and seasons on earth. But if you are in tune, walking in step, so you've got to be in tune, walking in step. If you're walking in tune and in step, you will not miss God's plans and purposes. 
Wisdom will be your portion. Are you with me? You'll be walking in the will of God. You'll be walking in the timing of God. So you must know the timing of God. You got that? So the first one that I want to emphasize to you is understanding the times. You must understand the times. Say that, understanding the times. Do you know, right now in our church, there's a grace on our church. There is. Brother Nathan and I were sharing the other day, his home cell in Phoenix has grown to what, 40, 50 people? Close to 40, almost going to 50 people in, 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 in Phoenix. What does that tell us? Louise started a home cell. How long, Louise? Stand up. How, 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 how much has it grown by? 25 people. All she did was started with her family. Phoenix, as Brother Nathan's bringing people, now, please don't get, think I'm using them as examples, that this is to tell you what's going on, but it'll stir you up too. As he's bringing one family, that family is bringing another, and then that family is bringing another, and then that family is bringing another. And every week they're bringing someone. And, and so, so what does that speak to me as the pastor of the church? There is a divine grace on the ministry. Amen. Look at what's happening in Louise's home cell. Pastor Wesley went to Pinetown, and uh, we had such a good feedback from Pinetown with the people there and things that are happening there. It was so great. On Thursday night, I met with almost 50 people in the dining hall. Let me tell you what happened. We had two home cells. One was Louise's home cell. The other was Brother Cliff's home cell. And then there were a few visitors, two families from Tonga, and it came to over 50 people that I saw on one night on Thursday. Let me tell you, everyone was asked to bring some snacks. They brought some snacks. One lady cooked a big pot of biryani. We didn't ask her to. Pastor Mark didn't ask her to. She just came up to Pastor Mark and said, I, I got some food. So Mark said, what food do you have? I've got a big pot of biryani for everybody. And, and, and a sweet with that. And everybody ate to their heart's content. And there was such a vibe. And there were testimonies. Now, Sister Gonham was there, so I'm not lying to you. One lady who was completely a Hindu lady, staying in their flat. In, in Louise's, so Louise had contact with her, but she was a Hindu. Hadn't given her heart to the Lord. So what she did was, in her flat, in privately, with no Christian there, took out all of the Hindu things herself and was praying, came to the home cell that night here on Thursday, and in the meeting of the home cell, I led her to the Lord. I asked her, I said, do you want to receive the Lord? She said, yes, pastor. She received the Lord. Then she came to me afterwards. What was her name, Sister Vasi? She came to me afterwards and she said, what do I do with the God lamp, Pastor? Someone asked me to give it to her. Do I give it to her or do I, what do I do with it? I called Louise and I said, Louise, go clean it out and throw it away. Is that not a grace? Amen. Trevor's mother was here, mother-in-law was here. She was a Catholic, not, not given a heart to the Lord. On Tuesday night, I led her to the Lord here. She just received the Lord like that. So, what do I see? See, understanding the times. There's a grace in our church. And because there's a grace on the church, we need to capitalize. The time's here. God's knocking your door and saying, Hello, everybody, I'm here. Come on, whatever you say will happen. There's a grace... There's a grace for new cars. We've had from the beginning of the year, was it just after the beginning of the year to now, 22 people that bought motor cars 
in the church. The last testimony was Louise. Louise said to Louise and Edward were trusting God for a car. And they sold an amount of money into the car they were buying for me. And Mark said to them, trust God now for your car. Someone gave them supernaturally 12,000 rand as a deposit. Hey? Three different people gave them 12,000 rand. They went and bought a car. Now, it's not a Ferrari, but from where God's taken them to that spot, it was a promotion. You understand? There's no such thing as I've got a better car than you. And No, no. It's the fact is God's people are being promoted. They're going from one level to the other. We acknowledge that. If they had a half a loaf of bread today and then end up with a loaf of bread, that's promotion, brother. So there's a grace on the church. I have from last month to now, in all of the home sales we had, we had almost... I spent 50 times 6, over 300 people. Tins, you were there a couple of times. Uh, Nathan, you were there. Pastor Wesley, you were there. I spent time with over 300 people, just, just having tea with them, visiting with them. There was a lady, let me share this with you. I'm, I'm just giving you some testimonies now. There was a lady that walked in here on Tuesday night. <laughs> There's a grace. A lady from Randburg, we don't even know her. Our offering on a Tuesday night, this Tuesday night that went by, was higher than Sunday. It was mm, four times higher. On Sunday, compared to Tuesday, one lady came here from Randburg, put an offering of 16,000 rand into the offering thing. And when Mark told me, Pastor, someone put in a check for... I was, uh, but here's the issue. He said, not from our church, Pastor, she's visiting. I said, wow. I'm recognizing all of these things. I'm saying, wow, there's a grace. Amen. People giving their hearts to the Lord. Amen. People buying new cars. People getting promoted. People getting healed. Bradley's wife was healed here. She had spondylosis on Tuesday night. And uh, she lifted her hand when I prayed. She got healed. Four days sick leave. She had three days vacation. She came here to give a testimony. She sat in the reception. She said, Pastor Mark, tell Pastor I got healed. The doctors diagnosed this and da, da, da. I got healed. And we are sowing a car to the church. So she asked Mark, how do we sow the car? Mark says, bring the logbook. So they're sewing a car to the church. Okay, it's not a brand new car, but the issue is look at their heart. There was a lady here. God moved on a, for a contract. She was late in submitting the contract. What's her name? Renee. And uh, she prayed. She kept on saying to her sister, she said, Pastor, preach, no problem, no problem, no problem. She says, no problem. They reversed the whole decision, gave her the contract. Then she bought a brand new microwave in a box. I have not seen it yet, except they pointed out to me the other night. She brought it and left it in the kitchen. She said to Pastor Mark, this is a brand new microwave for the church. And Pastor Mark says, but we have a microwave. She said, never mind the church growing. Here's another microwave. <laughs> Same as the lady that brought that pot of biryani. I'm showing you their heart. It's fantastic. Something's happening. Edmund, you, you, brother, Gonham, brother Cliff and Sister Gonham brought Edmund and Mandy to the church. Mandy's dad is a, is a pastor, but they ended up members of our church. They've been here a year now. For a long time, this guy was unemployed. And being unemployed, he was trusting God for a job, etc., etc. And it, it was, a, a, you know, it was a struggle. Eventually, he came one day to my office. My, I'll never forget that. Unemployed, no money. He came, he brought a big, large amount of money to me. He said, Pastor, I'm sowing this as seed to you. I said, I'll receive it. You're going to be blessed. 
So asking after him for the next few months, he still was not employed. I said, don't worry, God's with you. You'll open a door. The next thing I heard, he's in business now. He, he, he started something, then got into business, and then he flew to Joburg to sign a contract. Where If they come here tomorrow, I'll, I'll, I'll get them to share the testimony. Fifteen new stores opened in Johannesburg. They gave him the whole contract. And he's 25% shareholder of the company now. If I'm unemployed, and his child was sick, the doctors, it, it was a, t I don't know what was the cause, and I, 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 I remember Mandy kept on calling Mark and complaining, my child is sick, and, my ch and Mark was encouraging her, but the one night Tuesday when I was spring, she put her hand on the child. She went back, child completely healed. Went back to the doctors, and the doctors are baffled now, how's a child healed? Dale. Dale got accepted in the, uh, what program is it, Dale? Dale, Dale wanted to become a pilot, so he applied in a program to be accepted. They accepted him, and they wanted to send him to Pretoria for training. So he shared with Auntie Zubeda, Sister Zubeda. said, you know, oh, I have to leave home for 10 days. And Zubeda turned around and said, Dale, you never know. They can change the thing. This is what happened. They changed the whole program, brought the program to Durban. He doesn't have to go to Pretoria. And the lady that made the comment was, or your, your, his mom made a comment that the other lady said, it's never been done before. So first time they changed. What am I? Look at that. Oh, there's so many testimonies. If I stand here, I think I'll go all night. The things that are happening. There's great grace. Say great grace. Amen. There's great grace upon the ministry. I said to Pastor Mark, what used to be a struggle before is no struggle anymore. Right. Let me share about the goodness of God. <laughs> I went to Swaziland. And uh, now maybe I shouldn't share that. Okay, I won't share that. Not nice. Okay. See, Pastor's learning. <laughs> God's also training me. When to keep quiet, <laughs> just keep quiet. Let's turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. See, as God's training you, He's training me too, right? We're all in training, amen? Yes. We're all in training. Hallelujah. So there's great grace. Great grace. I'm telling you, great grace on the church. Great grace. I said great grace. great grace. Now let me tell you who bought the last new car when. Um, I think Nathan and uh, Sister Louise bought their last car. And Vernon and Priscilla, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't a new car, but nonetheless, from what they had... To, this was a better car. God gave them a, a Mercedes Benz. Uh, Nathan bought a new car, an X5. Louise bought a car, Edward and Louise. I was so glad for them. Yesterday, Sister Zubeda, Pastor Zubeda, got a brand new Volvo yeah. out the box. So there's, there's, there's a grace. There's a great grace. Great grace. So the people of God are going to prosper. Amen. I'm telling you. Amen. And if anyone is in your home cell or under your leadership and if they're struggling, you tell them, no, pastor said the struggle's over. Amen. I'm telling you. Tell your neighbor the struggle's over. The struggle's over. We're going to move upwards and forwards. That's it. Now, I'll share this with you. The secret of a prophetic Christian is that you are not considering your circumstance. While you look at your circumstance and it is telling you the contrary, in other words, the wind is contrary, it's boisterous, but you refuse and you look at the storm and say, be still. Yes. That's the secret. 
don't consider your storm and don't consider your wind. Amen? Now, I'm going to share something very profound with you. Turn to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 46. The Bible says, I, I shared this on, on Thursday at the, with the home cell, but I think you must catch this. It says, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with you. This is about Jesus. Let me paint a picture for you. Jesus was standing and speaking, and uh, some of his disciples came and said, Hey, Lord, your mother and your brethren are outside. They want to speak to you. And look at how Jesus responds, and he says, uh, 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 but he answered and said unto him, told them, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Take note of some things. He never mentions the word father. He didn't say, who is my father, my mother, my brethren? He did not say that. He says, my mother and my brethren. He did not use the word father. Now think about this. Jesus was standing speaking outside where his natural descendants, in other words, his mom and his brothers were outside wanting to see him. He denied them. He, he denied them. Jesus your, 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 your family is outside. His biological family was outside. He denied them. He looked at the crowd and says, Who's my mother and brethren? He says, These are my disciples. These are they, my, my mother and my brethren. That tells us a secret. Your biological family is not your family. <laughs> it's going to help you. Your biological family is not your family. I'm not saying be rude to your family. But they're not your family anymore. According to the scripture, Jesus said, You are born not by the will of man, nor by flesh and blood, but by the Spirit of God. You're born by the incorruptible word, which is the word of God. So Jesus looking out, he says, No, that's not my mother, that's not my brethren. He said, these are my mother and my brethren. He says, these here are the disciples. So in other words, as a born-again Christian, as a leader in the church, you've got to understand something, that your brothers and sisters in Christ are more family to you than your own family, your own uncles and own aunties and own nephews and all of that. Because you are now different. God is in you now. So you are not from beneath, you are from above. You have a father. He's called, according to that scripture, your heavenly father. You got that? Ooh. Some of you are getting free in your minds now. All the aunties and uncles that manipulate and control you, they are not your family. Your brothers and sisters in Christ here is your family. Listen, look at this. He says, he says and he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do. Now, watch this. Here, here, here's some things to take note of. Let, let's share them. Number one, he denied the biological family and said, This is my family. Number two, he did not use the word father there because it was his heavenly father. Jesus knew that his heavenly father was his father more than Joseph. Joseph was mentioned for a while in the scriptures and after a while it went silent about Joseph. Joseph is not even mentioned at the crucifixion. Joseph is not even mentioned after the ascension or just prior to the ascension. The scriptures are silent about that. Because Jesus Christ gave the clarification that it is, from a little boy, 12 years old, he was more clear in his mind. When his parents, when he got lost and they were looking for him, he said, did you not know I was whisked about my father's business? He knew his heavenly father, God. He said to his mom and dad, did you not know my father's business was the work of God, the will of God at 12 years old? 
You got that? I mean, right through the scriptures, Jesus kept on speaking about his heavenly father. I only do what he does. I only say what he says. And then outside the tomb of Lazarus, he said, Lord, he says, Father, when I pray, I know you always hear me. He, de he denied his biological descendants or his offspring or from where he came from. Why? Simply because Jesus knew he was from above. Are you from above? Amen. Yeah, he even said the greater than Solomon is here. And then he said about Abraham, he said, from before Abraham was, I am. He didn't, then these guys turned around and says, but you're not even 50 years old. He says, uh, how can you say that? He, they did, couldn't perceive spiritual things. Jesus was saying to them, I'm from back there. Me and my father were one. Question is, how do you look at yourself as leaders in the church? Do you look at yourself as, oh, well, I've got family commitments and I, you know, auntie and uncle. And, and, and you put the church last? No, you should put the Lord first, the church first. This is your family now. Now, let me share something else with you. Very important. You got that now. How many of you got delivered by that statement now? Let me see you. You're no more going to serve an altar now. Family old. <laughs> I'm not saying if you're married and you got your wife and kids now, don't take care of them. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying don't acknowledge your family and be rude to them. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying the children of God are more family to you than your own family. God only used them as a means to bring you forth. Jesus didn't say, ah, Joseph, my father. Did you not know? Let's be about my father's business. So when family comes, did you not know I must be about my father's business? But you're going to church. It's my father's business. But uh, why are you so churchified? My father's business. Why are you so passionate about winning souls? You can make a lot of money, you know. My father's business. Why are you running crazy to church? My father's business. Why every night I phone home and uh, uh, want to speak to you, but they say, you're going to church, you're going to church. Are you going crazy? My father's business. One man came to Jesus. He said, I want to follow you. Jesus said, great. He said, but just one thing, Lord. My father died. He says, I need to go and bury him. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Jesus was so single-minded, so committed to the gospel. He just was so bent on obeying God's will. He knew where he was going. He knew where he came from. And he knew where he was at. That's what you should do. You must know where you are, know where you came from, know where you're going to. You're from above, not from beneath. God's got a will, plan, purpose for you, and He's taking you into that destiny. Don't let anyone derail you. Now, let me give you a last amplification of that scripture. Isn't that scripture now alive to you? Oh, ha, ha. Listen to this. He says, For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same as my brother, my sister, and my mother. That means not everybody in church is your brother, your sister, and your mother. That's right. So they all walk through the door. Hi, I'm a member of Christ's embassy. Uh oh, are you? I'm your brother. Are you? Well, how do you determine whether you're brother or sister? Those that will do the will of the Father. Yes. So you we could be sitting in the same church. If you're not doing the will of the Father, hey, brother, I've got a problem. We're not family. If you really want to join this family and come into this circle, you've got to do the will of the Father, which is in heaven. In other words, you've got to talk like Him, walk like Him, exhibit the fruit like Him. You, you, you get that? That's, that's heavy. 
So how would you determine or discern? You shall know them by their fruit. I'm not saying don't pray for them. I'm not saying don't encourage them. I'm not saying don't point them to the word. Beware of. They're not outside. Pastor Chris said they are So as a leader now, as a, as a spiritual leader now, you've got to be sharp. You know, the Bible says study to be quiet. Study to be quiet. Now, I talk, and Zubeda says to me many times, she says, but you talk so much because it's a gifting on my life because I'm a teacher. I need to teach. So when I'm with people, I talk. I want to inspire them, encourage them, give them the word. Because that's a gift that comes. But when I'm alone at home, I don't want to say two words. You'll find that strange. It's true. Ask her. When I'm alone at home, just leave me with a book. Or if I'm watching a program, I'm just quiet. Leave me alone. I don't want to say nothing. In fact, when someone talks to me, I'm irritable, really. But when there's like this, there's an anointing that comes on me to teach and speak. What was the point I was trying to say before this? I said, study to be quiet. As a leader, be sharp. Tell your neighbor, be sharp. be sharp. The Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you shut up, you will hear what the other one's saying. <laughs> Is that not true? Especially for someone you need meet first time. Why? Because you must hear what they are saying. It might be so the guy wants to commit suicide by the end of the week. He's determined, I want to commit suicide. And you go and you want to tell him about your ministry now. God's given you the prophetic and he's given you this and he's given you that. If you kept quite long enough, the guy will say, you know what? I, I, I really had enough. I, I don't want to live any longer. So you can keep that. You, you, you can... You can Close the door to that guy. You will tell him about your ministry and how God's using you. And Don't tell people how God's using you. They'll see. No. I don't even say to people I'm a pastor. True. I'd wear jeans, t-shirt, go to a store, laugh, joke, carry. I don't tell. You don't see me carrying myself like a pastor. Really, if I'm not in the pulpit dressed like this, if you see me with jeans and t-shirt, you won't know who I am. And I like it like that. People mustn't know you're a Christian by your words. They must see it in you. You'll exhibit it. and say something different about this guy. I mean, I bought a car. Uh, we went and bought the car together. And from the manager to the salesperson. And they were talking about how people are committing fraud by falsifying their IDs and stuff like that. They turned around and said to me, they said, wow, we can see you're a good man. Uh, you can see, they turned to Mark and said, you can see you're a good man. These are, you are good people. So they saw something. They must see it. So tell your, tell your neighbor, study to be quiet. Okay, not with your friends now, okay? I'm not talking about your friends now. I'm not talking about your friends. I mean, your husband walks in, your wife goes quiet. What's happening? Why do you want to talk? Pastor said, study to be quiet. <laughs> I'm not talking about that. Not talking about when you with familiar people, you know each other, you're chatting, you're laughing, you're joking, that's fine. I'm talking about when you're meeting someone for the first time, or second time, or third time. Keep quiet and listen what they have to say. Because then you can pick up whether that person's a dog or a sheep. Ooh. You just let the person talk long enough. You'll know what spirit they're carrying, whether it's of Christ or whether it's an antichrist spirit. Someone might say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I go to church. I'm born again. And if you say to them, can you say Jesus Christ is Lord or was born in the flesh? They cannot. Then you know it's a demon. Because the Bible says so. It says no man can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord is saved by the Spirit of God. But how are you going to determine and detect these things if you're blabbing 10 million, you know, words per minute? <laughs> Does it make sense? Don't be cross with me. I'm sharing with you. Pick up. 
there was a pastor came here. Let me give you an example. I'm not picking on you. I'm just showing you some secrets in ministry. I didn't call you here to give you a hiding. I called you here to give you some pointers. There was a pastor that came here, and he phoned me, and he came from uh, Mozambique. And uh, he came and stayed here. We put him up in accommodation, and I took him to, to, to lunch, Pastor Mark and I, uh, and Wesley. Uh, we went for, for lunch, and I kept quiet and never said a word. And I was just listening to this guy, and he went on. And he was talking. He started to tell me about his church and then how he's fighting with another pastor. And that pastor, what he did to this man and how the government was involved and how he did this and how he did that. Ah, and he went on. And I was listening. Hi, Brother Arnold. And I was listening. And part, Mark said to me after I got the car, we, I mean, it was two hours there, teens. We're just talking. I was listening to this guy. Mark said, Pastor, you didn't say a word. I said, no, Mark. I was listening to this man's spirit. I said, he's all wrong. Something wrong about this guy. Well, we put him up to stay in one of our people's houses. He was staying there. This brother, bless his heart, I mean, he is such a nice brother. This, this man in our church, such a big heart. I don't want to mention his name, but... He, he, he had such a big heart, and he thought, well, I'm doing this for pastor, so I'm going to please pastor. He started to take this man around and show him the place. So he took him to our old building. You know our old building in Avoca? It's still standing there as a church. He took him to our old building, and one of our brothers in the church is a businessman. He's renting our building there. So this pastor goes, and he looks at it, and he says, wow, what a nice building. Are you selling this building? Can I rent this building? So the businessman in our church turned around and says, well, what do you want to do with the building? He says, I want to start a church here in South Africa. I said, wow, I got that back. So I said, oh, you came here with the wrong motive. You came here with the wrong heart. So I marked him. And when he went, I never phoned him again. You understand, I I'm sharing with you how you can pick up these things. So tell your neighbor, study to be quiet. So you can pick up the spirit of the other man, whether it's an antichrist spirit or whether it's the spirit of Christ. Whether he's speaking inspired of the Holy Ghost or whether he's speaking of a, <laughs> inspired by a demon or, or, or just by a carnal nature. Okay? Say hallelujah. hallelujah. So the definition of the family of God is, is your brothers and sisters in church, Right? And you know that um, it is our policy in church to know people and love them. Say, know people and love them. And our, and our vision in church is to build people, equip them, and send them. So we build people, equip them with the Word, and send them out to the harvest field so wherever they go, they can win souls and bring them back to church. Okay? So it's build them, equip them, and send, send them. All right. Don't build a nest and settle down. I'm talking to leaders now. Don't build a nest and settle down. Someone's going to ruffle your feathers. Some of you have already settled down. I'm telling you, it's the truth. I always said this to church. People that have been longer with me. Wendy, how long are you with us now? Four, five years now. Five years. You heard me say this, Enos. I always said, I said, guys, we're going somewhere. In this ministry, we are not stagnant. We are going somewhere. I even said here, I said, we have not yet even started. We haven't started shaking ourselves like Samson, you know. We haven't. We are about to. Here's the issue. What happened to you when you joined the church? You were just so excited. We couldn't keep you away. You'd come to my house. Pastor, can I buy you Nando's? Can I buy you lunch? Can I do something for the church? Then you'd buy something for the church. And then I'd say, oh, let me give you money. And you say, oh, no, no, Pastor. I can't take money from you. Why? I want to do it for the Lord. What happened now? You've settled down. You have. Because all of the new people that are coming in now with a Fresh heart, fresh attitude, they just going rat-a-tat-tat-tat-tat. 
and they're driving it right in. Then you are looking at me and say, but I'm here longer. But what happened to your attitude? You settle down. Leaders that settle down are like the, Egypt, uh, the nation of Israel traveling from Egypt to the promised land. They pegged their tents. God said, let's go. The fire, the cloud pillar of fire moved. The, 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 the sun moved. The fire moved. The cloud moved. They said, uh-uh, I'm settled down. You're not going to go anywhere in ministry like that. Better check your spirit and shake yourself up and get going again because the new people have overtaken you. Big time. Big time. I don't want you to be there. Shake yourself. Tell your neighbor, shake yourself. Shake yourself. Like, you know, Ines made a comment. I asked her earlier on. I said, Ines, where are you? I don't hardly see you. She said, what, what did you say to me? She said, oh, Pastor, I'm, 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 I'm busy in the Word. I'm deep in the Word. Uh-huh. You're so deep in the Word, you've got no time now for your pastor and your church. Ooh. It's showing me your heart now. Not that she doesn't like me. It's just that what she used to do before, she doesn't do now. And slowly you'll be like a little boat that's going to drift further and further away until one day I'll have to get binoculars to find you. I won't even find you. Why? You fail to press in. It's a truth. And, and I'm, I, don't get cross with me. I've got to ruffle your feathers to get you moving again. I'm not saying this out of... Uh, you know, every now and again, ask Zubeda if Reverend Tom don't phone me, I phone him. Reverend Tom, I didn't hear from you such a long time. Oh, Pastor Singh, I've been busy. I said, how are you? Fine. How, how are things? Re Pastor Chris, if I don't hear, I send him an email. doesn't matter if he doesn't respond. I send him an email. I'm making a demand. I'm keeping in contact with the people I perceive God is motivating me with. You have to do that. Let me give you another example. I gave you the example of the microwave. I gave you the example of the lady that cooked biryani on Thursday. I mean, the guys just ate. Trevor, I was going to Swaziland. Bless Trevor's heart. Don't change, Trevor. If you change, I'll sort you out. <laughs> I went to Swaziland. We, you remember, we took about 20 people, went to ha have a, hold a crusade in Swaziland. Trevor went and bought half a lamb. He phoned Sister Zubeda. Uh, I bought half a lamb for Father's Day. I want to bring it to the church and buy it for the fathers, <laughs> for pastor and for all the fathers. But Trevor, we're not here, we're in Swaziland. Ha, ah, why didn't you tell me? Because she got the message after. He says, no problem. He says, I'll marinate the meat and I'll keep it till you come back. So when we came back, I said, Mark, let's have a leaders meeting. Phone Trevor and ask him if he can cook us some Cook, cook that half a lamb for us. We found Trevor, no problem, Pastor. I'll cook it and bring it to the church. Let all the leaders eat. Look at his heart. You've got to keep your heart there. Your gift will make room for you. See, let me share something with you as leaders. Let me share this with you. And I teach on this many times. And sometimes people think I, I go overboard. But it's a secret I tapped into and it works. The Bible says your gift shall make room for you. Most times in the full gospel church, they erroneously taught it was your spiritual gifts that will make room for you. Well, lots of people have spiritual gifts and they died along the wayside. They, you don't even hear them today. So it wasn't talking about that. In the East, it was just good manners when you're going to visit a person that has some stature in the community in the East. It was a culture. Because you must remember, we're talking about the Hebrews and we're talking about, you know... They took gifts. Yeah, the three wise men. They took gifts. That gift will make room for you. Amen. Now let me share something about a seed. A seed or a gift gives you an indication of what type of heart you have. Open heart, closed heart. I mean, Sister Salo, every time we have something in the leaders meeting, on Tuesday she cooked a whole bowl of vermicelli. I never asked her for. Zubaydah never asked her for. She, she just cooks something and bring it. She doesn't have to. 
doesn't have to. She can say, I'm busy like you. But she does it. Why? Open heart. What happened to you? Tell your neighbor, catch a wake up. <laughs> hey? Auntie Violet. Auntie Violet here and Brother Dennis. She will phone, Pastor, I want to cook you something. And I said, we have more food than we can eat now. <laughs> I don't want to grow sideways. But I mean, look at the heart. Are we after the food? No. Are we after the gifts? No. It shows me what type of heart you have. All right, tonight when Brother Trevor is going to feed us, is Pastor going to eat the food? Talk to me. But look at his heart. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm telling you, there's a secret in it. Don't let it go. Tell your neighbor, don't let it go. Don't let me have to pick up a binoculars and look in the sea how far you've drifted away. Right? Just stay close. Oh, this is a very important spiritual law that I'm sharing with you. And I do it, you know. Nathan, you came with me. Boisley, you came with me. Earl, you came with me. Mark, when I go to the meetings, do I not take a gift? All the time. Now, here's the law. If you at any level of leadership fail to do that, when one day God places you on a higher level of leadership, other people won't do it to you because you have not done it. What you sow is what you reap. So if you want promotion, you want people to bless you, be a blessing. Just keep on being a blessing. And even sometimes you know, the devil will say, ah, it's not working. Don't listen to his voice. He shouldn't be speaking to you. Just keep on pressing. 